here to walk in the light so that it may be clear to As Jesus said, you let your light so shine before them, so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What should we do? Will you walk in the light or the dark? Let the 
them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of your deeds with shouts of joy. The second reading is from the second chapter of Ephesians, beginning in the first verse. You were dead through the trespass of sin in which you once lived, following the course of the world, following the ruler of power. The spirit is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our faith, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved, even when we were dead through our trespass, made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and sealed us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For the grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your doing, it is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that we may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Why should rise for our gospel application? Page 
We see the faces of friends, of family, and of loved ones when we think of God's love poured out. Maybe we even define God's love as it relates to only certain groups of people, certain denominations, races, or ethnic cultures as our personal definitions and allowances and acceptances allow. While we claim to be welcoming and encouraging in faith and in worship, open and hopeful for all the Spirit of God might do in our midst, are we really ready for what these verses are challenging us to believe and to understand about God. Let's see what happens when we get to the Amen. One of the most challenging things of John's Gospel is to take the entire story as one long sum versus taking it or hearing it in only pieces. To capture what Jesus is saying in John 3.16, we have to look at the text before, and especially the text after. The text before gives us the context that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, the Jewish leader, in the dead of night. We're not told why Nicodemus has come at such a late hour. Maybe he's fearful of what others will think and say about what he's doing visiting this Jesus guy. Rabbi, Nicodemus says in verse 2, We know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Because of the wonderful and marvelous things that Jesus is doing, for those in need, Nicodemus and the other Jewish leaders have concluded that God is at work in Jesus. What was once thought to only be a bomb, what was once thought only to exist in the realm of the divine now has come to live, dwell, and work within the confines of the human. What a hugely important statement of identity. But now the question to be answered is why? Why would God choose to do something like this? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. It's because of love. For no other reasons than eternal and sacrificial love, God broke into our world and into the lives of us for our sake. But remember what we said about listening to the entire reader. When we stop at only verse 16, we do a disservice to the gospel text, to the good news Jesus is proclaiming. In so many supposedly Christian settings, the word believe is used as a gatekeeper of the Christian faith. We filter out those who come to our churches by way of saying, if you don't believe like me, worship like me, or practice faith like me, then you must be someone for whom this promise just skips over. Little do we even begin to imagine that the overarching promise of this text isn't our Lutheran world, it isn't the Catholic world, nor is the Pentecostal, the non-denominational, or whatever your flavor of Christian coffee happens to be. The promise of God that has been made in Christ Jesus our Lord is for the cosmos the entire created world. And that promise is continued by the less memorized and even far less memorialized, verse 17. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. The purpose of Jesus being sent into the world isn't judgment and punishment, but reconciliation and love forgiveness, and second chances. David Lowe's commented, it is not judgment as punishment, but judgment as crisis, as tragedy, as loss. God comes in love to redeem such loss, turn such tragedy into victory, and demonstrate true power through the sheer vulnerability and sacrifice of his son. This radical gospel we read and proclaim means then that Jesus was sent so that all who walk in the valleys of darkness, 
those whose lives have been lived in the shadows might find the light that is him. It is by Christ's sacrifice and through God's love that the world has been given the gift of grace. No longer do we walk, do we have to walk in darkness, for the world has seen the great light that is Christ Jesus our Lord. It is not our job to decide who is in and who is out, who is worthy or who is not worthy, acting like filters or sunshades. <laughs> yeah, thought of that one on my own. <laughs> as filters for Christ. But instead, it is our responsibility as disciples of Jesus Christ to be the encouragement of the world to see all that Christ is up to in their lives, to show them the light outside of their dark realities. This is the hardest part of our Christian journey. <clears throat> to be people of the light means that we are called to walk from the dark and dingy into a world that is many times dark and dingy itself. And to speak to that world and live in that world the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and deed. In doing this, in living a missional and active faith, means that we oftentimes do so alongside people who have never even seen nor experienced the life of Christ before. And in some cases, People who don't care one way or another about this light we are talking about. So how then do we speak with authentic and active faith in times when the audience is less than receptive? I believe that it all begins with the relationship we personally have with our Lord and Savior. If our own feet are not planted firmly and centered on the Word of God, if our stewarding of our time, talents, and treasures for the glory of God and the furthering of His kingdom is not first and foremost, then we cannot be authentic proclaimers of the gospel we are reading. We are then, as Jesus teaches, like a house that is divided upon itself, and we cannot stand it. If we do not believe and haven't internalized the gift of grace, love, and forgiveness that has been won and given to us, then our speech is only hot air with no substance, no authenticity. And if we don't fully believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, died for my sins, and rose that I might have eternal life, then can we truly make a personal witness to someone else that opens the door to Christ's light? I have to say no. But there is a remedy to our current situation. Believe for yourself that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. Believe that Christ died to rid the world of all that seeks to separate you from the love of God. And believe also that Christ is daily seeking to remind you that you are loved, that you are forgiven, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's right, nothing you can do about it. There's nothing in God's green earth that can or ever will be able to separate you from that promise of new life and love that is found in Jesus Christ our Lord. Even if death knocks at the door, life is waiting on the other side. When you have fully internalized that promise, made it a part of who you are, so much so that it exudes itself in all that you do, from that point, your personal mission begins. No longer will you be hindered in your service to the gospel. For God's love of the world will be leading and challenging you to share the light of Christ. No longer will you sit idly by, watching and waiting while people suffer or are in need. Because God's love for the world will compel you to get up and do something about it. And no longer will there be people in our families, in our churches, in our communities, or even in our world who doubt that they are worth loving. Because God's love for the world will be so present, so active through your words and deeds, that their doubts will be washed away. 
then there's that radical gospel of love again. God's love is desperately seeking the lost and the found. Those in the light and those in darkness. And that love wants to get through the, to you through the spirit that is active in you, your friends, and all those that surround you. So I ask, will you be the one that believes Christ's promise is for you so that the work of the Spirit might be done through you? Or will you be the one that remains in doubt, waiting for and seeking the loving reassurance of someone else? 